Welcome to Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset's Health Talk. I am Dr. Douglas Oshinsky of RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group. Lung cancer is one of the most common cancers in men and women and the leading cause of all cancer deaths. The good news is that due to declines in smoking and advances in treatment and early detection, the number of lung cancer cases nationwide has declined in recent years. During today's show, we will learn more about the risk factors for lung cancer, prevention strategies, and the latest diagnostic and treatment options. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Lee Gerson, a thoracic surgeon with Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Somerset's Steeplechase Cancer Center, and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. In accordance with social distancing due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Gerson will be joining us remotely via video conferencing. So tell us, since we are going to be talking about the lungs, tell us a little bit about those two big organs in, the, in your chest, what they do, the normal function of the lungs, and why, some, why, why do we develop lung cancer and a little bit on lung cancer itself? So the lungs are essentially two big balloons uh, that exist in that live on each side of our chest. And when we breathe, uh, we're actually, um, our muscles are actually causing the balloons to expand and pull air in. And that air carries oxygen to uh, the blood, our blood, which is returned to our heart and lungs without uh, very low in oxygen. And the lungs help exchange the uh, oxygen that we breathe in with the carbon dioxide that uh, our cells produce just uh, by going through the normal course of their workload. Um, so the, the biggest function is really that gas exchange. Um, the lung also serves as uh, a filter of sorts uh, for certain chemicals uh, in our blood uh, that you know, made it through the liver or the kidneys, for example, they get filtered out by uh, the lungs as well. So uh, lung cancer is a um, disease which develops from an abnormal growth of the cells that make up uh, the lining and the tissue of the lungs. And uh, what happens is there is a change in the, um, the genetic code, the genetic material, the DNA of that cell, which causes it to start growing and dividing in an abnormal way. Um, our lungs are exposed to a lot of different stresses because uh, the, the air that we breathe in has chemicals, particles, things that um, you know, can cause some stress on the cells. And when the cells uh, under, are, are under uh, some stress, it causes them to divide and change, which is what uh, we think leads to these cells starting to grow out of control. So we have these two uh, large uh, balloons that uh, expand and contract. When our diaphragm uh, goes down, it expands. When it goes up, uh, it uh, releases it, forces right. the air in and out through the nostrils and or mouth. No, correct. We have the uh, cells that are, with, that are embedded within the lung itself, the alveolar, which uh, mm -hmm. take in the uh, oxygen, and then the arterioles that come to the alveoli and get rid of the carbon dioxide and pick up the oxygen, sending it back to the heart. The heart then sends it through the left uh, the atrium, left ventricle to the rest of the body to allow us to, uh, uh, to actually live since uh, we do need oxygen to uh, supply our muscles, uh, bones, etc. Correct. You pass. 
<laughs> is that a, is that a board question? <laughs> so I wish I wish it were that easy. So because of that, those some of those cells do sometimes have abnormal growths, and they right. when they have the abnormal growths and or they uh, start to reproduce uh, much faster than the rest of the cells. That's when we get some abnormal growths, which when under a microscope we call them cancers. Yes. Now there are two major type of lung cancers. Can you tell us a little bit about each one of them? I can, um, but I want to explain the um, uh, cancer process a little bit further. Uh, the word tumor is usually used, certainly um, in the community, um, synonymous is usually used interchangeably with cancer. But you know, a tumor is uh, also an abnormal growth of cells. What what separates um, a tumor? or what makes a tumor benign or what makes a tumor malignant is that those cells that start to grow ab, uh, abnormally also um, evolve to come up with ways to escape their local environment. So when we talk about cancer spreading, that's what we're talking about, or cancer metastasis, these cells have found a way to break free from the main tumor and either go through the blood or through the lymphatic system and they're carried to other parts of the body where they set up shop and essentially you start growing lung cancer in you know, the places where the cancer spreads like your brain or your liver or your lymph nodes. Um, the two main types of lung cancer, um, we, we break them down into two big groups which are uh, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. And those two groups uh, were basically created uh, or that organization came from the fact that um, the small cell cancers uh, and the non-small cell cancers essentially behave sim more similar to the other tumors in that group rather than uh, to each other. The prognosis is different and uh, they, they're, um, the small cell cancers are a lot more aggressive than the non-small cell cancers. But within non-small cell lung cancer, for example, you have uh, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma and uh, various other types of tumors, um, which are uh, a lot more common, thankfully, and usually a lot easier to treat. Now, the big thing about all of this is that a lot of cancer, such as lung cancer, there are risk factors. Uh, and a lot of the risk factors are environmental, especially for lung cancer. Can you tell us about the risk factors so that our audience can hopefully reduce those risk factors? Yes. So uh, the number one risk factor for lung cancer uh, is smoking by a long shot. And uh, unfortunately, it's not just the uh, smoking that we do. It can be the smoking that we are surrounded by. Uh, but just to give you an idea, um, the estimates are that 80% of lung cancer, so eight and 10 of all people who get lung cancer, either smoke themselves or spent a significant amount of time around people who smoke. So if uh, we place a lot of emphasis uh, in the public behind getting people to quit smoking, and you know this, this is one of the main reasons why. There are other um, uh, risk factors which are a lot less common. Uh, some of them are chemical exposures, radon, for example, radiation, um, and asbestos. Um, and there are also a lot more, there's a lot more research being done about uh, genetic risk factors which can lead to um, somebody's uh, higher chances of developing a lung cancer. So the big uh, thing that we have to remember is we want to reduce cigarette smoking and tobacco exposure as much as possible. Correct. And that includes, that doesn't just uh, refer to cigarette smoking. Um, it's really any tobacco product. Um, and if you want a way to um, visualize in your, uh, in your mind, what's happening is that the chemicals that we breathe in when we, are, when we are smoking or around people who smoke, those chemicals put our lung cells under a lot of stress, which causes our cells to start reacting to that stress, which is what 
eventually kicks off that um, chain reaction, which eventually leads to a cell becoming cancerous and growing. And in fact, if that's one of those things why smokers have that smoker's cough. Correct. The lungs actually um, take the uh, foreign material that comes into our lungs when we breathe and traps it in mucus. Um, and there are cells inside our airways that essentially sweep the mucus up towards our mouths where we uh, either cough it up and spit it out or a lot of times we swallow it without thinking about it. And that's the way we rid our lungs of uh, some of this foreign material. Smokers, uh, smokers um, their ability to clear that mucus is a lot, uh, is, more, is much decreased over somebody who doesn't smoke. So they have a lot, um, they have a higher tendency to create that mucus and their ability to clear it is um, reduced. So they end up having a chronic uh, cough that, um, and usually spitting up some, uh, some mucus. Which again, if smokers, uh, when they smoke, reduce the ability of the cilia, which are the, the little hairs that are lining the whole uh, uh, trachea, bronchial tubes going down to the lungs that allow the lungs to filter any foreign bodies that are being uh, in, uh, inspired. Correct. And by, by doing that, a non-smoker is able to bring that up and they either uh, swallow it when they uh, swallow, or they bring it up when they uh, spit something out. However, the non the smoker, their cilia are not nearly as good as as the non smoker. Thus, it stays in the lung, and that's why they're going to cough a lot more in order for the body to try to expirate that uh, uh, foreign body out of it. Right, and and um, another consequence of that um, condition, which leads to the smoker's cough, is. You know, if you have more mucus and you're not able to clear it as effectively, you're also a lot more susceptible or um, you can get pneumonias a lot more frequently than somebody who doesn't smoke. Now, the other problem, of course, is finding any abnormalities in the lung. When I graduated medical school back 30 some odd years ago, Every time a person came in and, some, and they came in for a routine exam, we would do a chest x-ray on them routinely. Approximately 15 years ago, when they looked back at that, they found out that the routine chest x-ray missed most of those uh, cancers until it was too late. So then the, the American Lung Association, along with uh, all of the pulmonary associations, came up with certain types of other tests in order to hopefully find it sooner. So can you right. describe those type of tests that patients should be thinking about when they visit their primary care offices so that we can possibly find those abnormalities earlier? Yes, this is actually a very uh, hot topic because the guidelines uh, recently changed. But... First, you have to understand that these big balloons that we're talking about, we're talking about are made up of billions and billions of cells. And um, most people uh, don't start to feel the effects of having abnormal tissue in their lungs because your lungs, uh, we have more lung capacity. We have some reserve. We have more lung capacity than we need. So by the time you start to have symptoms of lung cancer. And these symptoms are things like um, a worsened cough or maybe even coughing up some blood or you know, sometimes people start to lose uh, some weight unexpectedly or maybe even they have headaches or a pain in their bones because it's, that's where the tumor is spread. Uh, oftentimes that means that the cancer is um, too far advanced and our options for treating it are much more limited. So there is a benefit, um, this has been looked at extensively to identifying cancers early and treating them. Um, you mentioned chest X-rays, uh, they, they do pick up some abnormalities, but there are parts of the chest which are not very well seen on X-ray. And there's also a certain size that uh, X-ray is uh, not as good as picking up. So uh, the the research uh, compared x-rays to things like uh, looking at the cytology or uh, and analyzing the cells in your mucus um, and compared that to tests like CAT scans. And the um, result of that research is that uh, a CAT scan um, 
is really the only test that the best test that we have that can pick up uh, nodules early enough um, that uh, such that we can intervene upon them and really start to change the long-term prognosis of lung cancer. Um, if you look at diseases like colon cancer, or cervical cancer, or breast cancer, those uh, diseases have screening tests which have the right mix of uh, success in picking up early cancers and uh, without causing too much harm to the patient. So we have to think about screening tests in, in that with that uh, idea in mind, not over-diagnosing and over-testing, um, but also being successful in detecting early cancers. So uh, the uh, National Cancer Institute, the uh, National, uh, the American Cancer Society, um, all conducted research and um, decided that low-dose lung screening should involve, excuse me, lung screening should involve low-dose CAT scanning um, for uh, once a year for people that um, have a history of smoking. Um, and what changed recently is it used to be the screening would start at age 55. Now they've determined that the screening should go from start at age 50 and go all the way through to age 80. And the, uh, it used to be that we were only screening people who have the equivalent of 30 pack years of smoking. A pack a year is uh, if you take the number of packs you smoke every day and multiply that by the number of years you've been smoking, you get your pack a year smoking history. So it used to be that you needed a 30 pack year smoking history, which means technically you could have been smoking two packs a day for 15 years. And now you're in the category of people that needs lung screening. What's changed is um, now you uh, only need a 20 pack year history uh, of smoking to qualify for uh, lung cancer screening. But it's not just active smokers. People who have quit smoking uh, are not off the hook. You, um, if you quitting smoking is incredibly important as we've already discussed and really reduces your risks. However, if you quit smoking within 15 years, um, then you should still be getting screened with a low dose CAT scan of the chest uh, once a year. Which again is terrific because RWJBH at all of their facilities, the Somerset the Center, New Brunswick and St. Barnabas up in Livingston all have the low dose CT uh, screening. And again, if you are a smoker, you should uh, talk to your primary care to, about getting screening uh, if you meet the criteria. So let's go on to the next thing, the, the stages of lung cancer and then the meat of this. You're a okay. thoracic surgeon. You've got a positive, what do we do about it? What are the options and what is the long-term prognosis? The uh, low-dose CAT scanning um, that you mentioned at all of the Robert Wood Johnson facilities is really only uh, one piece of the puzzle. What's great about uh, the RWJ affiliated cancer center, the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, and it's uh, a subsidiary where I work, the Steeplechase Cancer Center, is that we have groups of experts, people who make their living treating lung cancer, who meet regularly to discuss each individual patient. So you can know, you can feel confident that if you are treated at uh, one of our facilities, that your case has been discussed extensively by um, a team that includes medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, radiologists, pathologists, pulmonologists, and surgeons like myself. And we come up with a treatment plan that is really individualized to the patient. Um, you know, the, the patient's primary doctor usually comes to that meeting and we, we take their lifestyle and their individual aspects of their life, which you know, don't necessarily fit in these neat little boxes that we learn about. And we come up with a plan that suits uh, their life and gives them the best chance of survival. So I mentioned radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and surgeons, you know, the, the, the treatment modalities, the, the different ways we have treating lung cancer, essentially chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. We like to say, or at least surgeons like to say that 
uh, removing cancer, if you can remove, if a cancer is early enough such that you can have a surgery and remove all the cancer, well, that's really the best shot we have uh, for um, long-term prognosis. Correct, or curing a patient of their lung cancer. Um, you asked about the stages. The, the stage is really the most important piece of information when somebody has a diagnosis of cancer or is suspected of having cancer because that stage dictates what uh, treatment options are available to patient and in what order they should have those patients. So they should have that treatment. The, so the stages are on a very basic level, you have stage one or tumors that are very small that are uh, only located in one area of the lung. And the survival of uh, stage one cancers is about 80 to 85 percent um, with treatment. And, and when we say survival, we talk about cancer survival in five years. So if you have one of these early lung cancers, you have an 80 to 85 percent chance of being alive in five years if you've undergone the proper treatment. The stage two cancer is still uh, very early. It is, uh, the tumors are a little bit bigger and they may have spread to lymph nodes, but those lymph nodes usually are located in the same part of the lung. And again, if we remove that part of the lung, then you know we think that we are removing all of the cancer and the um, survival rates are still reasonably good. And your five-year survival rate, if you have a stage two cancer, ranges anywhere from, um, it could be as low as 50%, but it can be as high as 75%, depending on um, the extent. Then there's a really big drop off when you get to stage three and stage four. Stage three is when the uh, tumor has spread to regional lymph nodes or lymph nodes in the chest that uh, we think of as separate from the lungs. And that uh, the prognosis really uh, drops to anywhere uh, from 10 to 15% survival of five years. But it can be, if it's an early stage three cancer, the survival rates can be as good as 40%. But when you start talking about stage four cancer, and this is cancer that is now spread outside of the chest, is spread to a distant site somewhere, unfortunately, you're, you, you have very little chance of making it to five years if your cancer is at that stage. But the good news is uh, we are coming up with, we've already talked about ways in which we're diagnosing cancer earlier, but there's also a lot of new drugs and treatments being developed, a lot of which are being um, evaluated and studied uh, through Rutgers and RWJ Barnabas Health that um, target new or novel pathways um, that lead to cancer growth and cancer spread. So um, these are things like um, the various genetic targets that we've identified uh, that can uh, have different medications, which have some, in some cases a better side effect profile cause less um, suffering than some of the traditional chemotherapies that can uh, keep cancer sort of contained and, you know, allow you to go on with your, your life. Which again, what, what you're describing is this whole collaboration that's done both at RWJBH Steeplechase Cancer Center and even better at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, which again is a nationally renowned uh, uh, institution for cancer therapy. It's the fact that you get together all the people and you basically come up with options and every option is explored amongst all of the people who are involved. The That's oncologists, right. the hematologists, the radiation therapists, the uh, surgeons, and basically you're getting second and third opinions at the same time as getting the primary opinion. Without having, without the patient having to go to those, each of their, those individual offices, that's correct. And you're able to do it all in one sitting so that the person's not having to travel from here to there to there and waiting six months to come up with a, a good plan right. while this tumor is growing. Right, so that's what, correct. So what you've got is you've got these excellent 
physicians who are putting their brains together all in one spot, coming up with multiple plans, each one putting out that plan, everyone thinking about that plan, coming up with whether it's the right way to go or the wrong way to go. And again, yeah. it's done both at uh, the uh, Steeplechase Cancer Center as well as the nationally renowned uh, Rutgers Cancer Institute. And thus, the patient can come up and get a plan that's from multiple, multiple people, and they can understand what's going on. Right. Whereas, uh, I mean, most of the people I trained with, not most, all of the people I trained with and all the doctors I know are all very honest people who want to do the best for their patient. But if without this multidisciplinary approach, without this big team of people that, that bring their own expertise to the table, I might be concerned that if I see a surgeon, you know, a surgeon's going to be inclined to do surgery. But if you are being treated at, at um, you know, one of our facilities, if you're in my office, you can feel confident knowing that not only do I think you should have surgery, but the when we talk about it with uh, all the other experts involved, they agree that that is the best course of action. And they don't have to think that I am just, um, pushing surgery on the patient, if you will, because of my background. So instead now, of the piecemeal approach to the patient, we're doing the global approach to the patient, giving right. them the best possible option. That's right. And, and we do in these meetings, we do, it's not just talking about, uh, you know, will this size tumor in this age patient um, with these characteristics have X percent chance. I mean, we really do talk about the whole patient. We talk about well, they have their daughter's wedding getting ready to come up or they themselves are getting married or they have other some big life event. So that is going to dictate when they get this test. And, you know, and that really sets things like considerations like that really play into the timeline. It's not just data and cold, hard numbers. You, you We talked about surgery briefly and I'm a surgeon. So some of the most exciting things about lung cancer treatment I think are um, in the area of lung cancer surgery. But one thing that is important for people to understand is when you meet a cardiothoracic surgeon or a chest surgeon, it can be quite dramatic. That thought of you know having somebody cut into your chest can be quite dramatic. And I understand that. Um, but you know, this is things, this is these are surgeries that we are highly trained to do. And the great thing is, is there have been a lot of advances over the last 20 years in uh, more, not just minimally invasive, but more minimally invasive ways of performing these surgeries, which are uh, we're finding are just as successful in treating the cancer surgically as the uh, old fashioned ways, which you know involve um, a large incision into your chest. That's probably the image that patients are thinking about when they think of meeting a cardiothoracic surgeon and having their chest cut into. So there are, um, there's uh, VATS surgery, which is essentially like laparoscopy, laparoscopic surgery or arthroscopy, but for the chest. And there's even uh, robotic assisted VATS surgery that um, has really revolutionized surgery uh, of the chest, uh, you know, all surgeries, but particularly the chest because it allows us to do the surgery almost as though we have a big incision, except you end up with uh, a few incisions, the biggest of which is about a millimeter and a half. Um, and the, um, the pain is a lot less and less pain leads to less distress. And we know that the better frame of mind patients are in after surgery affects their prognosis. So I think a lot of these techniques are uh, really going to change um, the way we measure these things and, and lead to a lot uh, more success stories. Thank you, Dr. Gerson, for coming here. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for being part of RWJ's Steeplechase Cancer Center, as well as the nationally renowned uh, Rutgers uh, Cancer Institute of uh, New Jersey. Thank you also for all of your expertise in the VAT surgery and the robotic surgery, giving your opinions at these tumor boards. And the one thing to remember is, if at all possible, to remember 
remind all the patients that smoke to please give up the smoking. Oh yes, and definitely. see and see your primary care physician or your specialist and talk about uh, either smoking cessation, the use of RWJBH uh, cancer screening centers, and uh, hopefully we can sh we can turn the corner on on uh, lung cancer. This concludes today's episode of Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset's Health Talk. Please remember that the opinions expressed here by our medical experts are not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. If you need a physician, please call our physician referral line at 888-724-7123. For more information about Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset, please visit our website at www.rwjbh.org forward slash Somerset.